A listener note, this podcast deals with adult topics and is not suitable for young listeners. Violence against women and girls is a problem of pandemic proportions. At least one out of every three women around the world has been beaten, coerced into sex, or otherwise abused in her lifetime, with the abuser usually someone known to her. In today's episode, I'm sharing the tragic story of Tracy Fogarty Hayden, a married mother of two who was doing everything she could to escape her abusive husband. I'm Brooke Wilkerson. This is the Murder Podcast, and this is her story. Tracy Fogarty was a 29-year-old mother of two. She had a beautiful smile, dark brown hair, and dark brown eyes. Because of the time period in this story, there aren't very many pictures of Tracy online, but she seemed to be a very normal 1980s mom, with the exception of one thing. Simply put, her husband Tim was a criminal. He had a lengthy criminal record that started at 20 years old. Tracy and Tim had a tumultuous relationship, to say the least, with a number of police reports to support that. Police reports started surfacing back in January of 1985 before Tracy and Tim were even married, with a lot of the calls not even documented because at the time, that wasn't required. But these domestic issues with Tracy were not Tim's first run-ins with the police. He was charged a total of 55 times during the 1980s. Of those charges, he received one felony, 29 misdemeanors, and 25 traffic charges, with six of those being DUIs. But even with all of those charges, Tim had only spent a total of 23 days in jail. On top of that, in June of 1981, there was a mysterious death at Tim's apartment where a woman named Linda Toffby, who was 30 years old at the time, fell over the balcony railing and died. It was discovered that her neck had been slashed by broken glass before she fell, something that seemed to defy physics. Nonetheless, the case was closed within hours, and Tim was never charged. According to the Bellevue News Democrat, Tim's dad was a well-known contractor in the area and a prominent man in the community. Former prosecutor Clyde Kuhn said, quote, It's not a typical with these types of offenses and a middle-class background to avoid jail time. On the 26th of January, Tracy reported that Tim had punched her in the face. He was arrested at 2.30 a.m. and charged with battery. After he was arrested, he broke out the rear door window of the cruiser that he was sitting in and was subsequently charged with resisting a police officer. Reports state that the battery charge was ultimately dismissed, but Tim accepted a plea deal for the resisting arrest charge. Then, in July of that same year, Tracy called the cops again to report that Tim had punched her in the face and hit her with a belt. He was arrested again and charged with battery again, and again, the charges were dismissed. This time, though, we know that it was dismissed at Tracy's request, a common occurrence in domestic violence situations. As far as police reports go, things were relatively quiet for a few years, but that doesn't mean that the abuse ended. In fact, it's probably safe to say that it was worse. Tracy had taken the right steps and in the end, probably felt like those steps put her life in even more danger. In June of 1990, Tracy filed for divorce and was granted a temporary order of protection from Tim. It would later be extended until October of 1990. But in June, the same month that it was filed, Tim violated that order by threatening Tracy and was arrested. He was allegedly drunk at a country club when he made the threats. Later that week, Tim is arrested again for violating the order of protection again. This time, he showed up at Tracy's dad's house and started harassing Tracy there. In July, Tracy testified during a hearing. She stated that Tim had threatened her with a knife and that she feared for not only her own life, but for her children's lives too. 
She said that she had left him in May of that year and went to a women's shelter because she was worried that if she stayed with a friend or family member, that they would be in danger too. She testified that Tim had told her that if anyone broke up their family, he'd kill them and anyone who had anything to do with it. A friend of Tim's, Ron Ulrich, would later testify that Tim showed up to his house in June of 1990 and was upset because Tracy had left and taken their kids with her. He told Ron that Tracy wouldn't let him see the kids and that he would kill her before she would get away with that. Hey guys, if you're listening to the show, I'm going to assume that you have an unusual amount of interest in true crime, just like me. I'm also going to assume that you're going to love my latest obsession, Hunt a Killer. Hunt a Killer is a murder mystery subscription box where you get to be the detective to solve a murder. They send you a box every month with all kinds of reports and recordings, pictures, and even objects all related to the case. And they even have some digital items made available to you online and it's your job to solve the murder. The cool thing about it is that you can work these boxes by yourself, with a friend, or even a group of friends. It's perfect for a date night in, game night, or an after the kids go to bed activity for a single mom like me. Not to mention, if you can't wait for your next box, you can log in and have your next box shipped immediately, which is exactly what I did. (laughs) I absolutely love it, and I know you will too. If you want to check it out, go to huntakiller.com and use my code MURDER, that's M-H-E-R-D-E-R, to get 20% off of your first box. Just a few weeks later, on July 27, 1990, Tracy was inside Dundee's restaurant and pub with a group of high school friends for a sort of reunion. Tim happened to be riding his bike in the area when he saw Tracy's brother, James, and asked him for a ride to the park. Apparently, he said something to the effect that he was looking for Tracy and James didn't give him a ride. Tim then shows up at Dundee's where he sees Tracy and Tracy decides to leave in order to avoid him. But before she's able to leave, Tim leaves instead. So Tracy decides to stay, not wanting to see Tim in the parking lot either. Tim then goes to a nearby bar and he asks an employee for a knife, saying that he needed to fix his bike. When the employee gave him a butter knife, he said that it wasn't sharp enough. So the employee gave him a different one. She gave him a butcher knife with a six to eight inch blade and Tim left under the guise of repairing his bike tire outside. But instead, Tim hopped on his bike, which was not broken, and rode back to Dundee's to confront Tracy. Witnesses told police that Tim walked up to his wife and her friends and asked to talk to her. Tracy told him no, so he pushed her off of the chair, jumped on top of her, and started stabbing her with a knife he had gotten from the other bar. Bystanders at the restaurant quickly restrained Tim, and Tracy crawled away from him, but it was too late. Tracy was pronounced dead at 1.44 a.m. on the scene. Investigators determined that Tim stabbed Tracy seven times in her chest, abdomen, and thigh. Tim's lawyers tried desperately to get a change of venue for his trial, claiming that the widespread publicity would prevent him from getting a fair trial, but that was denied. When that didn't work, his lawyers then tried to say that his mental state wouldn't have allowed him to have intent to murder Tracy. They even had his therapist, who had been treating him for three years, testify. He stated that Tim couldn't have formed intent to kill Tracy and that he was, quote, out of control at the time of the stabbing. He also confirmed that Tim was an addict and that he displayed an acute sociopathic personality. But prosecutors put on the stand another therapist who evaluated Tim for the trial, who said the exact opposite, that, quote, the ability to form an intent was there. This whole debate seemed pretty silly to me since we all know that Tim went to a bar and asked for a specific knife before stabbing Tracy. It's not like he just happened to have a knife on him at the time. It seems like he intended on getting a knife and not just any knife, but a sharp one before seeking Tracy out. Nonetheless, both sides presented their arguments. One testified that Tim suffered from major depression, panic disorder, alcohol dependence, drug abuse, and borderline personality disorder. 
Experts found that even though Tim did suffer from mental illness, that he was sane at the time of the incident. On April 16, 1991, a jury finds Tim guilty of first-degree murder for killing Tracy. While Tracy's family cried, Tim walked away from the courtroom in shackles, and pictures from the courtroom show Tim flipping off the cameras with both hands. Tim was sentenced to 55 years for Tracy's murder. If you're enjoying this podcast and want to hear more full-length episodes, mini episodes, and more, then check out the Murder Podcast Patreon fan club. Not only will you be getting bonus content, but a portion of the proceeds will be donated to the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Check it out at patreon.com slash the murder podcast, and I'll also link it in the show notes. All throughout the 90s and 2000s, Tim fought his conviction, appealing it three times. At one point, he even tried to say that Tracy had simply fallen onto the knife during a scuffle at the bar. In one appeal, it was stated that a hearing for his competency should have been held to determine if he was fit to stand trial because he had been taking psychotropic medication at the time of the trial and sentencing. All of his appeals were denied. On January 26, 2018, Tim Hayden, 58 years old at the time, was released from the Menard State Prison on parole for good behavior after serving just half of his 55-year sentence. This was possible because Illinois didn't have a truth in sentencing law until 1995. That law mandates that prisoners must serve at least 85% of their sentence. If this law had been in effect when he was sentenced, then he wouldn't have been released until he was 77 years old. He was ordered to follow strict requirements until January 27th of 2021, when his 55-year sentence would officially be over. But in March of the same year, Tim's parole agent requested a mandatory supervised release after a woman filed for an order of protection against Tim. This was just 53 days after he was released from prison. The woman who filed for this order of protection told police that she worked as a cashier at a store and that Tim had been giving her tips, gift cards, and other gifts. He then invited her to a candlelit dinner at his house. In April, a judge decided that Tim was to stay 500 feet or more away from the woman and her work. But Tim continued to cause problems everywhere he went, eventually getting banned from a gym after telling some people disturbing and graphic stories. He told people there that he had been in jail for running over and killing three black people and that he was jailed a second time for stabbing someone. In August of 2018, police discovered a bag of marijuana at Tim's home, but he still remains free. In December of 2018, another woman comes forward and files an order of protection against Tim. This woman presented his parole officer with Facebook messages sent to her by Tim And when his parole officer told him that he could be arrested for it, Tim lost it. He told the officer that they would have to kill him before he would go back to jail. They said that he stood up, flexed his muscles, and said that he had worked out every day for 27 and a half years in prison and was in better shape than anyone that would try to arrest him. For some reason, none of this landed him back in jail. Instead, he was giving a mandatory supervised release ruling again, in order to stay away from the woman who filed for the order of protection. On December 29th, Tim called the police and said that he and that same woman had been in an argument and that she had left his house around 4 a.m. He told the police that if she were to accuse him of domestic battery, that he would shoot her, making the gesture of putting a gun to his head. The police told him that if anything happened to the woman, that he was suspect number one. But still, Tim was not arrested. Just a few days later, both Tim and the woman filed orders of protection against each other, but the judge ruled in favor of the woman and denied Tim's request. When reviewing these requests, the judge looked over six different orders of protection against Tim and said that, quote, the court finds that the balance of credibility, competing claims, and hardship weighs in favor of the woman. Less than a week later, in January of 2019, police were called to Tim's home again when the couple had another domestic violence incident. The woman told officers that they had returned from a bar and that Tim would not give her her phone back. 
He ended up slamming the glass door on her, shattering the door and cutting the woman's hand open. So a few days later, he was arrested and put back in jail for the incident less than a year after he was released for Tracy's murder. A judge ordered a two-year order of protection for the woman, and Tim's parole was revoked. The parole board determined that Tim had violated two conditions of his parole by having contact with a woman who had an order of protection filed against him, and because he didn't get any counseling for substance abuse, anger management, mental health, or domestic violence like he was supposed to. But somehow, in January of 2020, Tim was released from prison again. In October of 2011, a domestic violence center operated by the St. Clair County State's Attorney's Office was named the Tracy Fogarty Center. In 2018, the St. Clair County Prosecutor's Office charged 544 cases of domestic violence. The center is designed to reduce domestic violence and assisted 754 victims in 2018 and over 670 victims in the first half of 2019. Madison County also created a domestic violence accountability court that hears all intimate partner domestic violence related cases in order of protections. In Monroe County, law enforcement also created a program to help reduce domestic violence. One of those measures is to follow up with offenders days after a domestic violence incident to quote, put them on notice. The Belleville Police Chief, Bill Clay, told reporters that laws surrounding domestic violence started to change in the 70s and 80s. He said that, quote, they started recognizing that just because you have a marriage relationship, this doesn't mean that you should be able to be battered. It doesn't mean that you should be able to be sexually assaulted. Belleville Police Lieutenant Todd Kilback also stated that officers are now trained to recognize domestic violence and that they also take video when they respond to a domestic violence incident. He said, quote, you can see the house, you can see the disarray. Words in a report, they're just flat. And when you read them, they just don't convey what you see with the video and the audio. It has been very helpful. They also understand that a lot of victims won't want to press charges, and they seek out witnesses to the incident in order to move forward with charging the offender. Lieutenant Kilbach said, quote, with domestic violence, it's one of the rare cases where even if the victim doesn't cooperate, we can still make an arrest as long as we have an independent witness. Laura Repper of the St. Clair County Assistant State Attorney's Office said, quote, it's not the victim who makes the decision whether to charge an offender. It's the evidence. That's why it's so important for people who experience and witness abuse to speak up. The Violence Prevention Center of Southwestern Illinois has also developed a tool to determine how vulnerable a victim is and basically how likely it is that they are going to be killed. They created a form for officers to use that will ask if the suspect has ever tried to strangle the victim. Officers also encourage the victims to speak with the organization, which helps victims get out. Darlene Jones, the executive director of the center, said that, quote, it's the first 48 hours that the victim is at the most risk of being murdered. The whole idea is to reduce murders. She also encourages victims to get an order of protection, but reminds them that it's just a piece of paper. She said, quote, it's good for documentation purposes, but you still have to be safe, even if you do have an order of protection. Ruth Glenn, the president of the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence, stated that, quote, you have to be careful about encouraging someone to get a protection of order because it's almost converse, which is you're getting a protection order and you've probably heightened your risk. She said, we certainly know anecdotally that many, particularly women, lose their lives after they have filed for an order of protection. Even though a violent offender registry hasn't been created, in Texas, a law was passed in 2019 called Monica's Law, which created an online statewide registry where people can search for orders of protections that have been issued stemming from domestic violence. This law was created after 32-year-old Monica Deming was shot to death in Odessa, Texas by her ex-boyfriend who already had two orders of protection against him. Monica's dad, who is also a former police officer, said, quote, Monica's law cannot go back and save Monica's life or take away her family's grief, but it can help prevent others from entering into tragically abusive relationships that can lead to physical violence and worse, death. 
and it gives law enforcement officers an additional tool to understand threats posed by those with a history of domestic violence. Tracy and Tim's kids were adopted by Tracy's sister four years after Tracy was murdered. They were eight and five at the time. When the Tracy Fogarty Center was opened in 2011, her sister was present and said this, quote, this is a very special and very personal event. Life was good for them most of the time. She lived through some very, very violent times and she tried to fix it and unfortunately she could not fix it. As often happens with domestic violence, it ended in murder. Life goes on and it did go on and we have Tracy to thank for that. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and leave a review. You can find all of the show notes and more information about the podcast at themurderpodcast.com. That's the murder, M-H-E-R-D-E-R, podcast.com.